This is Jonathan Ferguson, the Keeper of Firearms and Artillery at the Royal Armouries Museum in the UK, which houses a collection of thousands of iconic weapons from throughout history. And on this week's episode, Jonathan is taking a look at the highly requested game from you guys, Metal Gear Solid V, which is safe to say he had a lot of fun with. <laughs> There's something absolutely hilarious about trying to sneak up on guards with a cardboard box on your head. That's amazing. But not what I'm here to talk about. I'm not a cardboard box specialist. I'm a firearms specialist. If there are any other games, guns and mechanics that you guys want to see Jonathan break down, let us know in the comments section below. And if you like this kind of content, we've got a brand new season of Loadout airing on the channel right now. New episodes will launch every Sunday, and we've already got an episode in the AK-47 and a deep dive into how games get sniper rifles wrong on the channel already. Right, let's take a look at the weapons of Metal Gear Solid 5. Now this, this is not too far removed from a real pistol design as I'm sure some of you would already know or have spotted, the AMT Auto Mag. Big old honking Magnum pistol. Now, it does, this thing does depart from reality in a number of ways, not least, yeah, it appears to have a sort of P38-esque slide rather than an internal bolt like the real Auto Mag, but the external look of the thing is pretty close to the real thing. Where it really parts company, of course, is in being a suppressed tranquilizer pistol. I'm not aware of a suppressed version of the of the auto mag. And we've got a you know laser module on the bottom of this thing. Unless you squinted, you probably would wouldn't even pick up on its uh, design heritage. Now I'm not a, an expert on tranquilizer guns. Uh, what I do know about tranquilizer guns is they do not take instant effect. Drug has to enter the bloodstream and pass around the body to take effect, and you don't instantly get knocked out. You become drowsy and, and unable to stand and, and you fall over. In which time you could have emptied your firearm at your man here <laughs> quite, quite comfortably. Otherwise, we'd probably fight wars with magic tranquilizer uh, guns. Right, we have a an AK-esque thing, but there are definite design cues here, notably in the pistol grip and the lower receiver from the VZ-58, the Czech VZ-58, which is actually quite different from the AK in terms of how it operates. Otherwise though, it's kind of a fudge of, of different AK-based systems. The overall impression is maybe a bit AKS-74U. The, the ribbed handguard that really makes this look like not an AK is, I don't know, it, it calls to mind the Germ, East German Vega derivative of the AK. Yeah, I don't know, I, I could I could start, I could list AK variants all day long, but I don't think any of them are a very close match for this, to be honest with you. Funnily enough, the buttstock looks quite a lot like the one on the Hungarian AMP, grenade firing rifle, or, or a, well, it's, it's a der derivative of the MD-65 intended to also launch grenades, and so the buttstock actually uh, reciprocates. It's not for adjustment, it's, it, it slides as you as you fire. And this looks pretty close to that. So what, what we have here is a sort of legally different AK, essentially. Right, so what little I do know about this game is that revolvers figure pretty heavily as signature weapons for, for a couple of the main characters. This looks very chunky, very heavy. I can't think of any particular design that this matches. It's far too bulky in the receiver, the barrel with the, the massive rib on it. Uh, it. It's pretty fantasy stuff. The ability, special ability, that this particular weapon can ricochet bullets off walls. I'm not sure why it would be specific, why that would be specific as a trait. Bullets either ricochet, or they don't. You can specifically, or deliberately I should say, ricochet bullets. Well, uh, in a, in a uh, riot control situation, less lethal rounds are bounced off, sometimes bounced off the, the ground uh, to, to ensure that no one is struck uh, in, a, in a, a lethal place. But it's, it's a very, very, very rare thing to be done deliberately, and it's not weapon specific, needless to say. Right, another sort of, I'm going to say legally different. I'm, I have a feeling there's probably more to do with creative license here than, than legal issues. Suffice to say that this thing evokes uh, the FNFAL or maybe the FN Cal or the FNFNC, 
I think it's supposed to be in five five six. So yeah, bits of bits of all of those really. Although the, re the receiver is kind of a bit busy looking. Something we see in video games is a sort of sometimes an over designing of lines and angles and curves where you know, form follows function typically in firearms design. Each of those angles and curves and shapes is there for a reason up to a point you know with things like the f2000 we we certainly are well into the um aesthetic uh fashion aspects where the insides are doing whatever and then the casing is shaped aesthetically but when you're talking about earlier machines machine or stamped steel designs they they typically are minimalist any unusual design features are probably some reinforcement for the sheet metal or lightening cuts to try to make the the overall thing lighter but certainly overall that with the front sight the the gas tube arrangement the butt stock and the overall impression it's it's very fn for me your suppressor is no longer effective bear in mind your weapon will be loud from now on calling back to one of our loadout episodes on suppressors or silencers. Do go back and check that out if you haven't seen it. It's good stuff, I think, and not just because I'm in it. The reason I mention that is we've just had a, a, an audio um, indication, and I think the suppressor must have blown off or something, that the sound suppressor on this rifle has, after a short period of time, spontaneously combusted, which is not something that happens. You can use suppressors basically all day long, and yeah, they'll get dirty, but um, not really an issue you might compromise their effectiveness eventually if you use them enough but they're not gonna they're not gonna go from silent to loud it, it's purely a gameplay thing needless to say you don't, don't need me to tell you that Okay, we've got weapon upgrades in this game, clearly. Suppressor on this one, a massive optical sight. Almost looks like a modern low power variable optic. Uh, mounted quite high, very high actually, for the for the butt stop. You'd need a cheek piece to bring your, your head up in line with that. Otherwise, you know, it's not gonna work well. Jungle mag, uh, taped magazines. A vertical foregrip, uh, sorry, front foregrip that's uh, the pistol grip design for the rifle. That's something we see a lot. Uh, the FBI, HRT, uh, hostage rescue team bodged foregrips on their MP5s. Uh, the SAS did it for a while as well. It's a very common thing. You get a spare spare component and you and you bodge it on. This is before vertical foregrips become standard. But after things like the Tommy gun, where again, that has basically a duplicate of its pistol grip on the front. Uh, yeah, interesting one here. This is somewhat reminiscent of several eight, uh, Hechler and Koch um, prototype submachine guns of the 1980s and early 90s, I think. SMG1, SMG2, where we get the MP7's sort of version of the sliding buttstock, seen on the MP5, of course, but uh, where, it, where when it's folded, when it's slid shut, it's kind of integral to the design, if that makes sense. And then you're pulling out the back of the gun almost to create the buttstock. The straight mag, the push pin lower receiver, it's all very HK. In fact, they're even the sights look like they're inspired by those. So this this is a sort of what if, you know, if HK carried on developing that instead of ditching it and going with the M UMP instead, we might have something that looks like this. Even the fire selector and the, and the symbology on there is also reminiscent. Uh, it looks cool. It definitely looks like something HK might have produced as part of that series. Yeah, so in actual use, we see that we don't have the don't quite have the HK diop to set up, and the charging handle is a, is a rather low profile, almost scorpion machine pistol esque sort of nub in, bit bit chunkier than that, but not as pronounced as, as anything like the MP5 or UMP or those prototype HK guns. Not ideal, I would say. It would work, but um, that's maybe where it would fall down as a functional design. Oh dear, standard Mad Max-esque sawn-off shotgun, but a, with a decidedly non-standard, large and bulky optical sight on it, and a huge flashlight on the left-hand side. We can here see these weird proprietary rail attachment points that I don't see how they're supposed to work. It's nice in a way that they've put them on there so that you're attaching it to something, but in a way I probably would have preferred proprietary mounts, you know, someone just drilling and tapping and, and fitting fitting the, the, the actual mount for the thing straight on, rather than implying that this is some advanced 
clip on clip off system that uh, if it has a practical way of working, I can't see how it would. More importantly, you don't want a great big optical sight and a flashlight on a essentially giant pistol. Okay, so I take I take it back slightly because the bulky optical sight is actually a red dot sight, and old red dot sights were bulky, but uh, still not ideal for a sawn off shotgun. I would suggest. I suppose I suppose the flashlight is always useful. I just I wouldn't necessarily attach it to a weapon like this. Then again, I don't know how else you'd hold it because uh, you need both hands on this on this puppy. You can you can fire sawn off shotguns one handed, but uh, sawn off shotguns aren't really recommended for anything to be honest with you, especially not without a butt stop. This belt fed machine gun, despite being 556 in the game, is well, I was going to say it's based on the FN Mag 58, but it's kind of based on the whole FN machine gun family, I think. The furniture is more minimi, the receiver is pretty pretty close to the mag 58 but it has more rivets almost like it's mashed up with a pkm uh, so what i've done because we don't have anything that's going to match this exactly is an excuse to show you a recent acquisition of ours this is a genuine mark 46 mod zero uh, an actual u.s military it well probably not issue but uh <laughs> made for the u.s military and we have relatively few firearms of that nature we often have the same type but we don't have one with the markings and the specific configuration. So the Mark 46 is minimi derived belt fed machine gun in 5.56 millimeter, partly why I chose it for this. You can see the family resemblance definitely with the bus stock and the pistol grip. Uh, the great big gas tube underneath is a little bit hidden by the handguard on this, but it's the same basic design as you see there. Being a lightweight design, this has a very short and fluted barrel. It's not on this one, that has a, a barrel much more reminiscent of the um, the L7, the M240, but uh, yeah, just a, a really cool, modern, lightweight, special forces LMG, essentially. And uh, in a funny sort of way, I think this is a better choice than the, the, the full sort of squad belt-fed gun configuration that I'm seeing in front of me. But I'm expecting customization that would, would make this a closer fit to this gun. Okay, pretty, pretty strong Uzi heritage on this submachine gun. Mini Uzi, to be precise. Similar sort of buttstock, similar sort of receiver shape, but substantially altered to not look too much like an Uzi for, for whatever reason. Uh, the blue, I don't understand, but I'm guessing is relevant to some ammunition characteristic. We've got magazines clipped together perpendicular to each other. That's something we do see in real life. Not done too, too commonly, but it is done. And of course, with something as compact as a, a mini Uzi, you are, by putting a big long suppressor on it, an opt a red dot sight on the top, jungle mags, you're, you're making this thing as big and bulky as something like an XM177 AR-15 carbine. May as well have that and get rifle caliber ballistics. <laughs> There's something absolutely hilarious about trying to sneak up on guards with a cardboard box on your head. That's amazing. Uh, but not what I'm here to talk about. I'm not a cardboard box specialist. I'm a firearm specialist. So I gather that the, the blue, which I very cleverly, not really, deduced was some sort of ammunition type. Funnily enough, it is a, the same sort of shade of blue that's used for uh, HK's plastic training rounds and simunition, things like that, to make sure that the weapon you're using, you know what it's set up to fire and you don't accidentally involve any live ammunition. Here, the idea is you're using effectively training ammunition to less lethally incapacitate people, which is not possible and not a good idea. This has no connection to reality. Well, the only connection it does have, of course, is riot, riot weapons that are less lethal that shoot some sort of polymer, once rubber, sometimes nylon. Those, have, though, are something like 37, 40 millimeters and are big, and heavy to give you that impact to actually have any kind of effect. Pain compliance, essentially, is how those work. Uh, if you need to go less than lethal, a beanbag shotgun, taser, yeah, there, there are various options out there, but in this scenario, it doesn't make too much sense. It's, it's not a great way to, to go about it. Oh. 
All right, next up, uh, more more period appropriate green furniture. I, I approve of that. That was that was a thing for a while. I say 80 is still wearing its um, green furniture, or at least some of it. This is very reminiscent of the Sig series of rifles, maybe with a little bit of G3 thrown in, and it's got a one of these less lethal barrels attached. You will see this. Um, it's probably what it's based on, actually. Um, sometimes they'll replace the whole barrel with bright blue or bright yellow if it's blank firing, and then swap the barrel back in for, for lethal. Uh, purpose. Sniper rifle time. Big old chunky thing. I would assume this is meant to be 50 caliber. Big old break, heavy barrel, very long magazine. Uh, in fact, everything about this thing is big. Weirdly, the scope looks out of proportion and, and too small, but neither here nor there. The only immediate thing that comes to mind here is how bulky and blocky that stock is. Then again, this thing's ahead of its time based on when this is supposed to take place. This this is very, very close to an Accuracy International AW50, which did not exist in this time frame. Functionally, I don't see why it wouldn't work, except that the magazine is very, very embedded in that big blocky polymer stock chassis thing and would be a little bit hard to extract. And uh, typically rifles will have, or rifles like this, will have more exposed magazines because so, you have to lever them out somewhat. And there isn't room for the levering as far as I can see. All right, well, I can see the bones of a, a GP25 or that series of Soviet design grenade launcher in this thing, but yeah, it's uh, it's pretty cursed. I'm not aware of a standalone grip stock for these, but even as I say that, I'd be surprised if there wasn't one. They, are in, they were designed as under barrel launchers for like the AKM and then the AK-74. Uh, this one's Bulgarian. They attach to the bayonet, or, the, or a secondary in this case, bayonet lug with a, with a push catch. So they're somewhat quick to attach. You, you definitely fit them to a grip stock. That's not the problem. The problem is the way these work, if I can demonstrate, uh, this is clear. It's muzzle loaded and then double action trigger. So you pull back and you can see it. All it's doing is dragging the hammer back and letting it fall. Very simple mechanism. And that has to be in line with the breech. Well, it doesn't have a breech, but <laughs> with the, uh, the back of the barrel for the firing pin to protrude and fire the semi-caseless round. Which is to say that multiples of them, of the barrels, with nothing directly behind them, cannot be fired. So this is a complete, this is a non-functional design other than the, the barrel that's in direct line with the trigger mechanism. Now, really, you'd need some kind of fairly sophisticated linkage to deliver enough force to the firing pin to fire off. Well, you need a second hammer <laughs> below this hammer, operated by both triggers, and I'm not seeing a, a ready means of achieving that. Oh, right, bullpup. This is definitely in my wheelhouse. This is not based on anything British. This is a really quite interesting mashup of G36, French FAMAS, maybe the G11 as well in the, in the lower receiver area. Quite a sound looking design. I like the fact that they describe what bullpup means. That's nice. As to it enabling quicker aiming and firing, that's, that's debatable and is being debated all the time. I don't think I'm going to weigh in on, on that one. Well, okay, so the theoretical advantage that we can't really argue about is that it makes it easier to fire one-handed, but, you know, you're only doing that in an emergency anyway. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> That's absurd. Well, that was absolutely absurd, but uh, lots of fun as well. So what, I mean, what can I say about a rocket arm? I'm not sure how he's getting it back after use. There's a, there's a weird nod to realism there in that the arm is, I don't know, using compressed air or a small small charge to launch it before the rocket motor then kicks in and you, you do your thing with it. Sums the whole game up really, an oddly thoughtful and somewhat realistic edge to an absolutely absurd idea. <laughs> Thank you, boss. Did he just thank you for spritzing him with water? Wow. 
Well, what a, what a gun to finish on. I, I have no idea what the context of this thing in the game is. I think even in this game, it has to be a sort of joke thing. Clearly, it, I mean, the way it's described in sort of like everything else, as though it's a real weapon, makes me laugh. Reminds me of the um, April Fools we did a couple of years ago. Uh, for Splatoon 2. The gun oh, it looks a little bit, well, it's generic self-loading pistol design, bit of CZ-75 in there maybe, I'll think what else at the moment, but then it has a, a plunger style uh, water pistol trigger, <laughs> it literally just sprays water. <laughs> What can I say? It leaves a, leaves a wet patch when it, when it hits, so again, attention to detail. Send me out on my next mission, boss. Right, well, a lot of you asked for that one, and uh, it was a lot of fun to do, I must say. Thanks for watching, as always. Um, you can always check out the Royal Armoury's YouTube accounts, um, social media, the website. If you're able to come and visit us, we'd love you to do that. Um, that's sort of request number one for a museum, really. Uh, come and see us if you can. Uh, obviously, we understand if you can't, and we're really happy to be working with GameSpot on getting the collection out there, especially for those of you who can't make it. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next time.